Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited for this author that is on today. I actually came across her through a mutual friend. Uh, I have had Sienna Snow on previously, and she could not speak more highly of this author. She has so much love and respect for her and actually mentioned that her convention that this author organizes really helped her break through her own glass ceiling in her author career. We're talking over a million books sold. We've been featured on Elle, on Glamour Magazine, US Today, Happily After, BuzzFeed. She's just absolutely amazing and I'm so impressed by her accomplishments. So I'm a little bit nervous about this interview because we're gonna learn a lot today, but most of all, we're gonna learn about her journey as well. The one and only Sky Warren, how are you today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, love Sienna so much. We actually live pretty close to each other. So it's nice because we make a lot of friends online. And of course we are, what do we even call this? Across the pond, we're like across the globe, <laughs> you and I. So um, so it's great to have you know some local people. And um, that's one of the reasons that I love to do RAM, which is Romance Author Mastermind is my um, event for authors. And it's just great. I love the community. Amazing. Well, that was actually one of my questions because I noticed that you lived in Houston, Texas, and as does Sienna Stones, I was like, hold up, are these coffee buddies here? What's happening? Um, what is it like living in Houston, Texas? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think, so the funny thing is when I started writing and looking for community, I found my local RWA chapter and you know, and I, I would go to the meetings, but A, I mean, I'm definitely an introvert, like extreme level introvert. So it was hard for me to sort of branch out. But then the other thing is that I've always been interested in writing books that are definitely sexy, definitely have some taboo stuff in them. Um, just, um, you know, that's just what interests me. And so these meetings would quite literally take place in a church, like they rented a church to have their meetings. <laughs> and so I never quite felt like I could let loose in the group. And so, I mean, and so for a while there, then I stopped going and I felt um, a little bit isolated. And the other thing is when you've been in this industry, I was just thinking like, um, I first published in late 2011. So we're coming up on my 10 year anniversary. And even though I know that there are definitely been authors who've been around longer. I mean, when you're, when you've been in the industry for this long, you actually see people come and go and you make really good friends who then go on to do something else in their lives. So I don't know, I felt really isolated for a while. And then that's kind of what spurred me to make Romance Author Mastermind because I wanted that community. And quite frankly, if I have an event that's pretty great and helpful, then I can get people to come to me. And I kind of think of it like um, a really big slumber party that I get to have in like my backyard, AKA the Four Seasons, like that's by my house, but like, <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting that you're an introvert because um, when I was politely stalking you <laughs> intensely, um, you are very much a giver back to the community. And so I was listening to a podcast only this morning with you. That sounds super stalkerish. Only an hour before now I was listening to your podcast, but uh, with Kobo, uh, it was very informative and you're very informative. You're very out there and you're very about giving back. And I find that quite interesting that you're an introvert with that. But I guess that does make sense creating the the convention that you would love to go to and having that at your backseat. That's perfect. <laughs> right. So uh, it's funny because my husband um, works in IT. I, that's actually my background as well. We both majored in computer science. We went to you know, college together. And so he now is a manager, right? And so he'll give people these personality tests when he's hiring to kind of see where they'll fit into the team. And one of the things it measures is introversion slash extroversion. And so I did the test just to sort of calibrate so he could see like, because he knows me, obviously. And I got literally like the lowest score, like the, the most introverted he's ever seen. And keep in mind, he runs this test on programmers, like exclusively. So, <laughs> and they're kind of known for being introverts already. And I'm the most. So yeah, I think, you know, it definitely, it does take a lot out of me. Like that's kind of the idea, right? Like introverts, introverts, it, you know, kind of lose energy by being around people versus gaining energy. Uh, but I think it really did happen because of seeing some authors who I loved. And the thing is, it's really important for me that we don't consider not writing anymore to be quitting, to be, no, to be failure, because 
because there are totally people who just want to do something else and have multiple passions and want to go explore something else. And so I don't want to equate that with failure. However, if someone wants to keep writing and wants this to be their career and wants to make a full-time living off of it, and then they can't, then that to me is the problem because, you know, and some of these authors, I have loved their books. So I believe in them and their talent and their stories. And so I think that's what really spurred me to want to do the conference and do also, you know, some of the other things that, that you mentioned, uh, where I run like a Facebook ads class and things like that, because, I really want it to be that if someone wants to make a living doing this, they can. That's that's kind of the bar. If you want to do something else, great. Uh, you know, I mean, writing in a way, like, I mean, it wasn't always my first passion. Like I, I did start off as a programmer and, you know, it was very like left brain. It was either going to be that or I was going to be like a doctor. I was going to be something scientist over on that side. Um, so I can understand having multiple passions. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, I really... I don't like the idea that, you know, artists have to be starving or that, you know, sort of stereotype of the starving artist, um, even that's sometimes romanticized, or we just say, oh, well, that's how it has to be. And so I try to shift, uh, the, you know, the paradigm around that and say that we are actually in control of our book sales, which sounds like kind of a radical idea. But when you think about it, when you look at other businesses that have nothing to do with art, it's very normal for them to not only um, forecast their sales, but also um, do marketing and campaigns that actually impact those sales. And so it's not considered, you know, that's that's a very normal thing. Target controls its sales, um, target controls its income. And so, you know, I'm like, we can take that that idea, that business side and strengthen that a little bit. And then it really comes back and just helps us, right? It helps our families and it helps, you know, us also. So we don't always feel like we have to churn out books because I'm not necessarily a super fast writer. So that was like never an option for me. Like, you know, that idea, I mean, I, not that um, I ever loved that idea anyway, but I also couldn't ch churn out like a book a month or anything like that. So yeah. I, I went off. I went off. No, no, not at all. I'm absolutely. I'm loving how much we're just going straight into this. I'm like getting <laughs> kidding. Um, and I absolutely. There's so many points in there that I absolutely love. And also on top of that, like a lot of it is mindset as well. As you're saying, like a lot of us are told. So, for example, I've been in this for seven years now, and we're told and we know that we have to treat it like a business. And I feel like at some point you become stagnant almost because you like okay where do I go now like I've, I've set my foundations what do I do now and the industry is so saturated in knowledge and a lot of the time you think oh where do I go like I built my tribe is there another mentor I can have and you kind of you're giving each other information but I think a lot of people are almost fearful to try and expand or do something different that they haven't done before and they're like oh I've tried everything and it's not working but perhaps they're just a little bit they need to go a little bit to the left and that's where they need to go with it. So I feel like perhaps, like the, as you're talking, I feel like that's sort of the mentality you might be really putting them in instead of just saying we need to think of this as a business, which you do, but how to practically do that as well. Because, yes, we are artists and so a lot of us might not have that analytical business background. So we might need tools or mentors to help us understand that path a bit more clearer. Right. And... And sort of ironically, I think that we, you know, like you said, there's so much mindset stuff. And one of the mindset things about business is that it's very sort of like stodgy or straight laced versus I think that if we apply some of the creativity that we have to business, then we can actually find more success. And uh, one of the things that I typically say both about Facebook ads, which I talk a lot about and marketing in general is that it's storytelling. And so if you actually step into a marketing sphere, like something that has nothing to do with books, it's just all about marketers getting together. What they study is storytelling. They actually have classes on it. They learn about it so that they can write content that tells stories. And that's already our strength, right? So, you know, so I think that we can, instead of looking at it like, okay, I have to put away my creative storytelling hat and now put on my like accountant hat. Instead, we could look at it like we already have the skill that marketers struggle to acquire and we can apply that. And so, yeah. So where were, okay, take me back to the start. You published your first book in the late uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. What 
why? Why did you publish your first book? And how did you quickly grasp onto the concept that this was the direction that you had to go? This is how you had to have your business, but your artist had on at the same time. What was your journey like? So I, like I said, I actually didn't really have the dream of being a writer, which I know is a little bit off, but I, and sometimes that does give me like imposter syndrome. Like, why am I really here? But I try to say that because I know there's always a few people like me out there who, you know, maybe don't feel like they fit into the mold, but, you know, but I think a lot of us contain multitudes and there's lots of things that we're interested in. And a lot of people come in, they were lawyers first, or they were something else first. And so I was working as a software developer and I had my son and it was around that time that I realized that I, I, first of all, actually, when I was nursing him, my husband bought me an iPhone, my very first iPhone. And so I downloaded the Kindle app and I started just like randomly searching for things. Self-publishing was really new. So I would actually look for the covers that were, I don't even know if you remember, I barely remember what they looked like, but they were terrible. They were just sort of like green with text on them. And I would look for those because I would know that they would be different than like the stuff you could get in the bookstore. They would just be a little bit out there. And I also hadn't discovered the romance genre yet. I just would buy books from bookstores and most bookstores, unless it's a specifically romance loving bookstore, don't either, they either don't have a romance section or they sort of hide it or have it very small or something like that. And so because I would constantly get my books from bookstores, I actually didn't know the romance genre existed. So through getting my Kindle as a gift and, or my, my iPhone that had a Kindle app, I was able to discover the romance genre and this idea of boundary pushing books, right? Like that, what I'm picking up on the shelf, you don't have to just stop there. You can write something else, something totally crazy. And I, so that's when I started to get the idea to write and I started writing down my stories. And I also, you know, it's, it's hard because especially then, even now, I think it's still true, but especially then it was so rare to see anyone talk about how much they made. And it was just, so it was like, when I would think about it, like, what if I, what if I wrote, like, what if that was my career? It, it just was, a black box. It could have been anything. It could have been, you're going to earn $2 or it could have been, you're going to earn $2 million. Like there was just, I mean, there was the idea of the sort of starving artist. So it wasn't going to be 2 million probably, but, but, I, you know, but I didn't even know, is it possible to earn a living or, or is that only for the massive authors, you know? And so, but it was in my head as a possibility because I was not loving going back to work and like being gone for so long from my son's life. And I wanted to, I wanted that middle ground. I wanted to work, but I also wanted to spend more time with him than I could at my regular job. So I started publishing and um, it actually helped me that there was a blog post written by Maya Banks. It was on the Dear Author blog and she was very successful at the time. Um, and she, but she said that she described different things about her business. And she also said that she had earned 300,000 that year. And that was, um, it was just kind of an eye-opening thing that she's very successful. At the time I was like, I don't need, I know I won't be as successful as Maya Banks, but I don't need to earn 300,000 to just replace my income and stay home with my son. And so it really just made me think this is possible. It's possible that I can do this. And so that is one of the reasons why even I'm a little bit more used to it now, like sharing my numbers because I've done it for a few years, but especially at the beginning when it was very hard because I definitely grew up in a family where you don't talk about money. So yeah, I saw the blog post and that really showed me what was possible. And so even though it's hard now or it was hard when I started talking about money, it's I forced myself to do it because I always think of that person who was in my place, yeah. who you know was maybe at a crossroads in their life and thinking about doing this and wanting to do this, but they just don't even know what is the range, you know, because a lot of people talk in generalities. Like you'll meet, you may see an author say, Oh, I'm struggling. Like, Oh, it's hard to pay my bills. But like, what does that mean? It could mean anything. It could be any number. Right. So to really put a number on it is just um, changes the story, I think. So, uh, so yeah. And after that, I really thought that my path would be to do more traditional publishing, and to write the sort of steamy contemporary books that I saw being successful at the time, which are steamy, but still a little bit like, I don't know how to describe it, like lighter, like brother's best friend, kind of like, you know, we hooked up or something like that. And in the box. 
<laughs> in the box. Yes. And I started trying to write books like that and submit them. And I ended up having some books published through smaller presses and, and, and that was a great experience in many ways, because I mean, definitely I learned the most about editing and the cycle that books should go through that I wouldn't have had if I had just done everything on my own. But I had a couple of novellas and I said, you know, I'm never going to sell these to anyone. They're just, uh, they're just sort of too rough and they're too out there. And, and, it, and, and I said, you know, and people back then, this was 10 years ago or really over 10 years ago, since it was before I had even published and we're saying things like, uh, like the market is dead, like it's it's over. It's just, you know, it's too saturated, even back then. It's too saturated, um, it's too hard to get noticed and, you know, no one can make any money. And I really was just curious, you know, I think that does come back to me being sort of a scientist at heart. And I really was curious, like, what, what does that look like? Like we can, I did have like a Twitter account that I was active on and things like that, but what does it look like if a book is just sitting on Amazon? Like, can anyone find it? And so I took these novellas and I just put a cover on them. I didn't have them edited, which I know is bad. I'd made my own cover, all this stuff. Like it was just, this is a, you know, do not do list, but I put it up there and I didn't tell anyone. I like told no one and I didn't have a newsletter. I didn't like, I had a Twitter account, but it was under a different, like I put it under a secret name. And so they didn't know about it, like in every ways, it, in every way, it was just literally floating out there in the Amazon land. And what ended up happening is I got about uh, two sales a day per book at first. And these were people who just, I don't know, stumbled across it through keywords or whatever. And then it started to grow. And then the only thing I had in there in the very back was a Gmail account that I made. And so I said, you know, if you have any questions, whatever, you can email me. And so I started getting these emails where people would say, oh, you should have a Facebook page so that I can follow you. You should have a newsletter so I can sign up for it. And it started to grow sort of organically. And I, and I would, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'll be a good sport about it. I'll do that. And then when I had something else that I really wanted to write, but that I knew again, wouldn't be a fit for a publisher, I would just throw it out there under this secret name. So that secret name is Sky Warren, which is who I am now. Because as it turned out, even though I published, oh, I don't know exactly how many, maybe, maybe 10 books through publishers or that other uh, pen name, I really, you know, and despite pouring more time into it and arguably more money into it, it was making a 10th what Sky Warren was making organically. And so from that, I really, it took me a while to learn the lesson because I didn't shut it down till either 2014, 2015. So for years, I just kept writing under both and one is making all the money and one is not. And I kept trying to make, you know, that name a thing and Sky Warren kept paying my bills. And so, so it took me a while. I, I would not say that I learned quickly. However, when I did learn, I really took it to heart that I, you always have to write whatever you're passionate about. And it's not that I didn't like those books when I was writing them, because you always can find something, you know, you know, I didn't, it's not that I hated the books. I, I liked the books. I loved the books. Even at times I would love the characters. There would be things about them that you would, you know, love. And, you know, you do your best writing and I'd be like, Oh, that's a nice poetic sentence. I just did. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, so in, in they would get, re you know, good reviews and things like that, but readers could just feel that my soul wasn't in them the way it was in these books and that they they want my soul. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, even, even when authors tell me something like, um, oh, I'm going through a hard time, which, you know, I understand. And my advice, it's not always fun advice, is write it, write it. Even if you have to write a metaphor about it, write it down because that's what readers want from us. They don't want, I mean, at least for me, I know that there are some people who, you know, authors who may have a totally different experience. And I think that's fine. But for me, it turns out that when I write what I think people want, even if I like it too, no. If I'm like crying while I'm writing it, they're like, yes. <laughs>
So I read one of your books last night in one sitting, which is porn. So thank you for that. Uh, so I need to start the second one ASAP. But it is not a genre I would usually go for. Um, you know, I usually read paranormal romance, completely different. But I loved it. And it very much is a dark sort of, you're, you're reading it going, oh, I shouldn't like this, but I kind of do. And I don't know where I'm sitting. And I love that that's basically the intent of your book. It's sort of that very dangerous, edgy feel to it. So can you tell me a little bit about what really drew you, I guess, to that sort of genre of writing? Like, obviously, you found that you liked a little bit of maybe taboo touching. I don't, I don't know. Right. <laughs> For sure. I actually, I love it and I sort of need it. And I, if I am left to my own devices and just write whatever comes to you, like that's what comes out. And so, you know, so it's just like my most natural form of storytelling. But the funny thing is in part from being an introvert, I think, and then in part from also just being like conflict avoider and a little bit of a people pleaser, it's actually really hard for me to, I don't know, present those books to readers. If I know that like they might be shocked or offended or, you know, just anything like that. And it's so funny, my first few book signings, like my in-person book signings, you know, and this was, I would go and people would come up and, you know, especially like I wasn't well known. Right. So, you know, they'd come up and they'd be like, Oh, what do you write? Like, like, you know, one, they'd be curious about it. And I would talk to them. I was like, I'd be like, Oh no, like it's, it's just really dark. Like do you, do you read dark? And if they wouldn't immediately say like, sometimes they'd be like, yes, that's exactly what I want. I'd be like, okay, you might like this. But if they would say, Oh, I'm not sure. Or maybe I'd be like, no, you, you don't want this book. And no. And it would, and it was so funny because I really meant it. Like I meant it sincerely. Like you don't want this book. And it almost was like reverse psychology where people were like, no, I think I want that book. And I'm like, no, I don't think you do. <laughs> Yeah. And I just think that's one of the reasons too, that it was really hard for me. There's so many reasons why it can be hard for us to market our books. And I think that was a big one is the fact that if I market my books, then by definition, while I will find people who love it, I will also find people who don't love it. And especially because I write those like sort of taboo stories, they won't be like tepid about it. They won't be like, eh, I didn't float my boat, but it was okay. They'll be like, this was offensive, you know? And so I was just, I didn't want to go there. And it was really hard for me to, even now, I think it helps the most when I advertise my backlist because I have a little more distance from it. I can, you know, be like, you know, that's a product. And if people don't like it, then they don't like it. It's totally fine. Um, if it's a book that I just wrote, I'm like, don't, don't tell me. I don't, <laughs> don't want to know. Yeah. Would you find that too, perhaps um, it escalated in your writing, I want to say. So you probably started, I'm just assuming, you probably started up going, oh, this is a little bit dangerous. This is a little bit naughty. And then as the books went, you started hitting marks that were perhaps a little bit more challenging for readers to go, I shouldn't like this, but I kind of do. Or do you think it's just always kind of fluctuated whatever the story was, you just went with it? So the funny thing is, it's actually the reverse. So for the few readers who've been with me from the very beginning, or if any reader like discovers me and they go back to my first books, which are still up, they are from, I mean, obviously anyone's first books are more rough, like, like story-wise or writing-wise or whatever. Um, I actually love reading writer authors' first books. Um, like if I read one of their books, I'm going to go back to their first books because I feel like that's when they were like their truest selves. And <laughs> And, and you can see, you can really see how they've like polished their rough edges a little bit, but that's definitely what happens with me. So my first books, I mean, they truly, especially my first books under Sky Warren, like they truly poured out of me. They were not something I sat down and thought of, I mean, I'm a pantser anyway, but even as a pantser, I spent a lot of time like conceptualizing it, thinking about my characters and just thinking about story structure. And they were like, I have no idea what's going to come out. I just have to sit and I just have to get out these 2000 words or, cause it just feels like it's like gushing out of me. And I, they were so dark. I mean, I, I don't even know if I could read them right now. And I definitely couldn't write them. Like some of the books I wrote at the beginning, I could not write right now. Um, because I am just, I don't know. It's like, it had to get out of me. It was almost like there was like this wounded part of me or something like that, that I just, I had to, I had to heal it with story and then it's healed a little bit. So I don't need to do it again. Um, actually someone who's completely like out of my sphere and, and out of my league really is Mary Bellog. 
she writes historical romance and she's, you know, really big author in historical romance and her, some of her first books, her, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say first, I don't know if they're first, some of her earlier books are pretty dark by anyone's standards. Like even by my standards, they include some scenes where you're like, wow, that was, that was dark. And like, not even in a sexy way, that was just dark. And, um, and so she's been asked, you know, could you write a book like that? And she's like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it again. Um, and so I, I, I think there is something there, like something that we had to like expel. Mm -hmm. um, and it does create books that, you know, despite all their flaws, uh, you know, especially being so early in my career and everything that readers connected with it, they felt that something was there in a way that, you know, they just don't as much for the other books. And so, and yeah, and so there was actually a shift a decided shift when my book started becoming lighter. So the funny thing is, I mean, I think you said you read The Pawn. Yeah. Was that the one? Loved it. <laughs> so the funny thing is, so I love The Pawn um, because it's still like probably my biggest and best like entry point for people who have never heard of me to come in and be like, okay, I get what she's about. I like this. I want to read more something like that. Right. So it's a really good entry point for me. And I get readers all the time, like you who are saying, you know, oh, it like pushed my boundaries or it was a little bit dark. So when I published this to my existing fan base, so like when this book was new, you know, they were like, when are you going to write dark again? So to them, this was like not even on the scale. This was like me going way light. Um, so I do, I think now it maybe fluctuates a little bit. Uh, you know, I sort of, I think it's a, it's a fine line between trying to harness what my muse wants to do, which is of course go all over the place and be wild, right? Like, I mean, a muse never even, my muse doesn't even want to finish a book. It's like, we're on to the next idea. Like, no, you have to do this. So, so yeah. And then trying to manage that with what I think readers want from me, but yeah, that early stuff was, I, I, did, I never recommended it to anyone and I still couldn't people, but, but the funny thing is like, like Wanderlust is a book and I can still be at a signing. It came out in, I think 2013. And so I could be at a signing like right before the pandemic and people would still came up come up to me and be like oh my god i loved wanderlust and like they know the title they know the characters like the fact that it's one like fifty thousand word book from that many years ago it's there's just something there i think no um, one go read it <laughs> no i'm gonna have to go no um i think you're, you're very spot on too when you say that like your start work is very raw and i think too a lot of people go into writing and it is a means for like therapeutic in a way because every book in my opinion and every book there is a small part of us and you will probably go whatever we're going through life at that time we're really channeling that energy that empathy that you know whatever it is so I think and a lot of authors that I've spoken to they started writing in a really dark place and that's why their original works are darker and you can see when through their personal life it's uplifted because it kind of carries through in their books as well so that makes complete sense to me and now I'm just gonna have to go back and start reading all your other former works <laughs> don't do it but do it for other authors when you like love them and then you go see their what their first book is like I, I literally will go and like search by newest on on Amazon and then I'll scroll to the very back and and whatever's there yeah that's so terrifying like I'm just like please never do that with like <laughs> just like that's so terrifying for every author like ah uh -uh, don't do that <laughs> you know I've literally considered unpublishing like my very first series just because, you know, it would be so shocking for someone who read The Pawn or, or my like, latest book, Private Property, which is also, it's it's very similar to The Pawn and not the story, but just, you know, where it kind of rides that edge where a lot of more people who can read it who don't identify as like, oh, I like dark books, if you, but you could still enjoy this book. And it would be so shocking of them for them to just pick up that other book. But it's also, I don't know, it's just also like part of me and part of my authorhood, right? Like just that I that I wrote these books and that's where I came from. Exactly. And you should be proud. It's your personal journey too. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to know a little bit. Okay. So I came across an article um, with you on wow women in writing and, and I absolutely love this website. So for anyone who hasn't hopped on, please do hop on. It is focused for female writers and it's such a good place to unsubscribe to the email. It always gives you where you can submit what's happening in the industry. So informative. And you did a really in-depth uh, interview with them about how you, I think it was published in 2018, so we've got a bit, of, a bit of time since then, but you invested 100K into Facebook ads and made 850, was it? Yes, 850, I think it was. I want to know, so you're obviously an advocate for Facebook ads, and I think a lot of authors find it super daunting because they don't know how 
to articulate or how to go into it, what would you say the three most common mistakes you find authors are doing when they're trying to start Facebook ads are? Okay, three most common mistakes. One would have to be starting during either a new release is the most common or during a sale when it's harder hardest to measure results. So what I love to start with is backlist that's sitting there and doesn't have anything else going on. And that's also really where you can almost see in some sometimes the biggest gains. So it's not always though you can use it this way and I do, you know, but you don't always have to use um, Facebook ads to push a big release even bigger. You can use it on something that no one, you know, no one's looking at because it came out in 2016 or 2013 even or, or whatever, but it's new to someone who hasn't discovered it, right? And so that would be one area. And another area would be, this is, this is a tough one because it's so ingrained. So what, how do you pick a cover, right? Like how do you pick a cover for your book? And the answer that people usually do is, well, they look at books that they like, they look at books that they like the cover, then they send those to their cover artist who either gives them one cover or maybe gives them a couple. And let's say they give them a couple. What do they do with those covers? They usually show them to their author friends. And so throughout this process, they've come up with the idea because they go through this process that they have the best cover for their book. Um, but what they never actually did is ask the readers along this process. So what ends up happening is that we have formed this idea of what readers like completely based around what we like. And then they go into Facebook ads that way and they say, okay, well, I'm gonna pick an image that works for um, me. This is what I would wanna click on. And they assume that just because they would wanna click on it, their readers would wanna click on it. Like um, there's two sort of very, the biggest common variations, especially if you write romance, fall into this category. One is I don't like Manchester, it just looks too, I don't know, cheap or sexy or whatever. And I, you know, I want to convey that I have a, you know, a real solid story. So I'm not going to use Manchester, even if it might sell better. And then the flip side of that is actually that readers only like Manchester. And so I'm only going to give them that. But both of these places come from assumptions, right? They come from assumptions. But the thing is, if you were running like a TV commercial, or especially you know, on a Super Bowl or something like that, if you were running a, a newspaper ad, you would have to decide that upfront. With Facebook ads and with any kind of cost per click advertising, it takes quite literally a few dollars and maybe a day for readers to tell you what they like. And so you don't have to assume and it does not benefit you to assume. Instead, test everything. That's like the, the best advice that I can give you. So. Um, what I even try to do is not only test, so first you pick the things that you like, and that's fine. And then pick things that you specifically don't like. And I challenge myself, I say, readers aren't going to click on that, but prove it. So I'll, pr I'll go in and prove it. And guess what? Every time, and I have, um, I call it author ads intensive. It's a course where, you know, literally, I think 800 authors have gone through it. I mean, almost everyone posts in there. It's not the image I thought. It's never the image you think. If you really stretch yourself outside of your comfort zone, then you will discover that that's true. So, and usually if it, if they are all picking, if readers always pick what you like, then chances are you're only running what you like. So a test is only as good as the inputs. So if you're only inputting three things and, and authors, it's very hard for us to see our own tunnel vision. And I include myself, I'm not above that in any way. Um, so an author will say, okay, I made six different images. So six different images, you think, wow, they've really run the gamut. So every single image will be a couple and they all look the same and they all have the same vibe and they're all smiling or they all do this or that. Um, or someone will show, um, say, okay, I created six different images, but they, they don't all have a couple. There's a couple and there's a man and there's this. And I say, you know, have you noticed they're all very orange? Like that's a real thing that happened. And just, you know, so we all have this, uh, just our personal preference. We all have our personal preference for an image and that's fine. Um, I mean, there's no way to get rid of that. Like I can't stop liking what I like. Um, that's not the point. The point is pick things that you don't like because you don't know what, what's gonna make readers click. And the other thing is even asking your own readers doesn't work because it's not about acquiring them. You already have acquired them. Ads is specifically about acquiring customers you don't have who may like things that you don't know of. So test, test, test as many things as you can. 
And then the last, so that was my second thing. And my third thing would be put the cover on the ad. It sounds like really simple, but there's actually a ton of data to back this up. So, and the data basically looks like this. If they click on the ad and because the image looks great, it does not actually mean that they are interested in a book because there's lots of things being sold on Facebook right? There's um, dating sites and there's movies and there's a million other things. So when you put a book cover, which is the 3D, usually like a 3D paperback looking book cover, then first of all, you're only going to get people who are interested in books, right? Who are a reader, who are, and um, so that's already a plus. And so you're typically going to get higher conversion. And the other thing is you get more text on there, which doesn't count, count against your text rule. Sometimes the image that they like is so disconnected from the cover that they might click on it and then glance over and be like, how did I even end up here? Like this, this doesn't interest me at all. Uh, so it's just for someone starting off, especially if I just have a second to glance at their ads and they say, you know, people are clicking, but they're just not buying or they're just, sometimes they won't even download a free download. And you think that's so easy. All you, you clicked on an ad and it's free. And yet sometimes people still won't convert. And the first thing I'll say is if the cover's not on there, put it on there. If it's not big enough, make it bigger. And corollary to that, usually putting a cover on the ad will drive the cost up a little bit. Actually, sometimes it brings it down. Some, but, but I would say most of the time, especially if someone hasn't tested their cover, it will bring the cost up. That's okay because maybe because your conversion will be higher and your ROI or return on investment will be higher. But if putting the cover on your ad skyrockets your cost per click, then the solution is not take the cover off. The solution is change your cover to something that doesn't repel the readers because that's what they're telling you. They're scrolling and they're saying, I was interested in a book that sounded like this. That's why I was gonna click without the cover. But once I saw the cover, no. So that's readers telling you they don't like your cover essentially. And you would not believe the amount of covers that I have changed that when I first shared that cover, I had readers say, I love this, it's gorgeous, it's my favorite cover. So those are just individual scenarios that doesn't mean it's gonna convert the best. So cover on that. <laughs> that's, that's amazing advice. Uh, I'm so happy. <laughs> I want to I want to know a little bit more about Bram, about the convention that you have created, because honestly, Sienna could not speak highly enough of it. Um, and so she really uh, said it was what helped her break through that ceiling and the amazing amount of hosts and authors that you have guest speaking. And I love that it's always a female panel as well. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? What can uh, perhaps authors who are watching if they're new to it? Where, where do they go to sign up? How can they how can they experience this? Right, so Romance Author Mastermind is what it's called. And it's designed specifically for intermediate and advanced level authors, which is a type of event that as far as I know, you know, wasn't around when I created it. And I don't think really is around anymore because, um, or even now basically, because, you know, events like, um, Romance Writers of America National and even more private events like, like Alessandra Torres Inkers Con are either very welcoming to beginners or even sometimes specifically for beginners. So that means if you're in a class, like if you're in a class on Facebook ads, well, if I'm the teacher and I know a bunch of people haven't published before or are just on their first book, then it just makes sense that what I'm going to share is going to be different, right? And certainly the kind of questions you're going to get during the Q&A are going to be radically different. And so I really wanted a place where we could talk about how to level up. Like I am already making um, a, a decently comfortable income, which is just so many of the authors that I know, but I'd like to be making more. I think I can do more, you know, and I just want a place where I can really talk about that. You know, even to an extent where I've seen, I've seen it happen where it, you know, someone would say, you know, cause, cause at any stage, at any stage, you can be discouraged and you can say, you know, I've been writing for five years. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making mid five figures and I just feel like I'm stalled out. Well, if you're at a place with beginners then someone might feel like, well, Hey, why are you bashing yourself? I'd love to be in your position, but if you're among your peers, people in your situation, they say, I totally get it. You know, I've been where you are. Here's what we can do. So I just wanted that kind of safe space, uh, for people who were in intermediate and advanced. And so we do have a minimum books published requirement. Um, also, all the inv invitations are invite only. We 
definitely let people ask for invitations because of course we don't know everyone and we don't know everyone who wants to attend, but you know, you, you just, we, we check your, you know, Amazon account and just make sure that we look, we think that like you could benefit from RAM and also that you could benefit RAM because it's kind of goes both ways in that community. And um, in addition to our incredible speakers, we also have uh, roundtable events where the actual attendees can share some smaller piece of information that they know. So it's really about knowledge sharing. So that is kind of one big difference between RAM and some of the other events that exist. And another thing is that this was a little bit more relevant when we were in person, but I think it's still relevant, is that um, with a lot of the events, they are really all of them, they would not pay their speakers. So what this would lead to is uh, speakers who would agree to speak because they were going anyway and not necessarily taking it very seriously. Um, I remember I went to this one uh, session. It was about writing romantic suspense and it was given by two authors who were just veterans. They were both New York Times bestsellers, had written, I don't even know, at least 30 or 50 books each. And the room was packed and I was sitting there and she, the first part, the lady asks, how many of you guys have ever written a romantic suspense? And 90% of the room raises their hand. We've all done it. That's why we're here to learn from the best. And she says, okay, well, we didn't really expect that. So, but I'll just start from the beginning. And she says, okay, so what is romantic suspense? And so she's only prepared this like super beginner conversation. And I do understand it would be hard to pivot in that moment, but you know, it's just, there really wasn't a way to, to say, you know, so that's something that when I ask, um, my speakers when they when they come when we had in person event we're paying your way we're paying um, you know all these things so that you can come and really in no way is this something where you were oh you're already going to attend this is something where we're actively bringing you in because of your expertise and um, and I make it very clear to them like you're speaking to authors who have all you know they're all mid list they're all some of them are even in the same situation as you they just uh may not know about the specific topic that you know about right because even on something like facebook ads there there are authors who make um six figures even seven figures who don't know about facebook ads and they want to know about it versus maybe they know something that i don't know right so that's kind of the idea of ram and so last year it was digital which was a nice surprise for everyone especially me um <laughs> Yeah, because we had already sold the tickets, um, we had our contract, and because uh, they have to be planned, you know, like years in a, like at least a solid year in advance is when we have to um, sign the contract if we want the date. And so we had everything booked and sold, and then the pandemic hit. And so, uh, and we, you know, like a lot of people who had events, we still owed the contract, like we still owed the hotel, um, the situation, even though we really couldn't have the event. So that was tough. And authors, you know, like they, they stuck with me, but they were nervous. They were like, I don't know if this is going to be any good. Like, um, and I was like, you know, it's like to a certain extent, I don't know either. We're all learning as we go. And so I just um, paid a lot of attention to events that were happening and tried to make it the best that I could. And we just had such an incredible turnout or result from our digital event that people said, you know, in some ways it was even people who had been to RAM before were like, I loved it. And somehow this was even better. And it sort of blended the best of both worlds in terms of like um, the live content and, you know, and then also getting to replay things. So I just, um, I think something about the event has a great energy. And I think a lot of it has to do with speakers that I, you know, pick the speakers that just are so positive and generous and giving. And then when attendees feel that they, you know, give back in that way. So reflect that too. So yeah. And so even as I was going up to Ram the digital, I was like, I'm never doing it digital again. If we can't have it in person next year, we're just not having it. But no, after last year, it really was so good. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this again. So, uh, so yeah, it is digital again this year. We'll see what happens in 2022. What are, who are some of the, who are some of your favorite, I guess you probably can't choose favorites. Um, I want to say some of the, the authors that came with these expertise, who are some? Yeah, so, um, and I just am so grateful actually, like that these incredible authors have said yes to coming, like that's what makes the event possible. And um, so the first year, I think we had Lauren Blakely and 
um, Alexa Riley was huge that year and um, Lisa Renee Jones and Whitney G. And then the second year, I'm just going to blank for no reason. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so last year we had J.R. Ward give a keynote. We had Jennifer Armentrout give a keynote. Um, and it was just amazing because they really do know their audience. Like I, I explain the audience and they know it and, and they spoke to things that just made sense to people who have been in this industry for, you know, 10, 20, even sometimes 30 years. And it's just a completely different conversation than if you're speaking to a room where half of the people aren't published yet. You know, I mean, it's just a completely different conversation. So, you know, and so they talked about some of the things that they go through or some of their hardships. And, you know, and again, you just can't kind of have that conversation with someone who's who's not published yet or who's almost more of a fan, right? Like, cause that conversation that we would have with a fan is completely different than one we'd have with a colleague. So, um, so those were, uh, also Brittany C. Cherry was last year. And so then this year we have Colleen Hoover, um, Kennedy Ryan and Nalini Singh. So, uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just an all-star lineup of people. And I also actually like to bring, uh, I like to bring in some names of people who aren't as well known, but who are sort of quietly killing it. Like if quietly making six figures, even quietly making seven figures, but they aren't for whatever reason, just seen, they don't have like the name recognition where you say, Oh, so-and-so. Um, but they're, you know, often really generous with sharing their numbers and their strategies. So I like to bring that side of it too. And yeah, I'm just, I'm just really grateful to be a part of it. Like every year, um, you know, I do a lot of worrying, obviously, because I'm not, you know, I mean, I don't have any history in event planning. That's not anything um, that I did. Like when I first, even like the very first year that I did it, all of my decisions were based on, you know, because they couldn't really be based on smart event planning decisions because I didn't have that experience. So they were just truly based on like what you said before, the event that I would want to go to. So, you know, as we're planning like the food and we're already doing it at the four seasons, so everything's really expensive. But we picked it because I'm like, you know what I don't like when I go to a conference and it's like everything's a little bit uncomfortable. And so you're just kind of trying to ignore the fact that you're too cold and that you're hungry because and then also like I'm a vegetarian. So, um, you know, and so even a lot of places will just either not accommodate you or they'll specifically accommodate you with like a salad, but like everyone else has a meal and you're like, OK, well, I can't go out. So I'm just going to eat the salad and be hungry. And so I'm like, you know what, we should just. Um, so she's like, you know, here's like a full buffet that includes things for, for vegetarians. And I'm like, great. Yeah. But let's add another thing. And also let's, you know, let's also give them snacks and let's also do this. And I'm just like, I'm just like, what would I want to attend? And, you know, and then, you know, Becca is my assistant and she was, you know, every, every year she shakes her head at me because I would, we would do, I would just always want to buy really nice flowers, like really nice flower arrangements for the tables. And I'm just like, you know, I just, I don't want it to feel like a corporate event, you know, with, and so, yeah, I mean, but so it's, it's, you know, it's not the best business decisions, but it's, it's a passion project for me. Where do authors go if they are interested in showing their interest for this year or even for next yeah, So, uh, romanceauthormastermind.com. Okay. Awesome. What would you say so far in your career, what has been your greatest challenge and what has been your greatest accomplishment? Oh gosh. I mean, my biggest challenge has been just my health stuff. So after, um, around 2015, I kind of hit a wall and I, um, was like a lot of authors who are workaholics. I mean, I was a workaholic and, and so, especially cause you know, right at the beginning, I was also doing regular work and then publishing. And then even when I stopped, you feel like, well, now that I'm not working, I have to spend all that time now on my business. I can't just relax. Right. And so, and then I hit a wall and I started sleeping 18 hours a day. And so I go and see doctors and, you know, they literally are like, there's nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, well, you know, like six months ago, I wasn't doing this. So <laughs> something's wrong. And after a lot, a lot, a lot of seeing different people, I finally saw a neurologist who said, you know, I think that this might be, um, she actually said to me, yeah, do you ever find that you are um, like sort of pushing down emotions or something that's suppressing what you're feeling. And I said, um, that's really my life strategy. And she, she was like, yeah, I think we actually might be dealing with depression. And it was just strange because, I mean, I actually knew I had depression, but it was what was 
it felt so physical. Like I literally, like I couldn't keep my eyes open. It wasn't just like, oh, I feel kind of down in the dumps. And if, if anything, I would be smiling and I would be laughing. And, and they, you know, they, I literally had a, one of the first doctors would be like, oh, it could be depression, but no, I don't think. And I was like, no, I don't think like, I feel hopeful, you know? So it just, it's just so happens that my depression doesn't present in any way of sadness. It just presents as being very flat and very exhausted all the time. And so, um, but even knowing that and then going and get treat, getting treatment did not in any way fix that problem. Well, not in any way. I don't want to say that. It's just that it didn't all the way fix it. Right. So then I could start sleeping um, 14 hours. And then for many years, 12 hours has been my norm with a two hour nap. And so um, there were times when many, many times when I could only work um, two to four hours a day. And so that's like total. That includes all of the time that I would be sitting at a computer. So you can write during that time, you can mark it, you can do whatever you want, but at the end of it, you're going to collapse. So it really is just a, I mean, it's a definitely a curse, but the blessing side is that uh, you have to figure out your priorities. You don't have the choice to try everything. You don't have the choice to do things that take more time. If I'm saying to myself, you know, I have to make X amount of money today to pay this mortgage and, and, you know, feed my child and, and live this life, then actually even writing took a backseat and Facebook ads took the front seat because I said, if I spend this much, I can make this much. And that's what I need. Just why I'm such a huge fan of Facebook ads, because I mean, it did for me what really nothing else could do. Like book web ads couldn't, you can't do that. You can't say, um, you know, it's not, it's not a daily thing. It's not a, here's what I have to make today. I can spend enough. If I, if I work hard enough with this, ad, I can make it happen. So that's been the hardest challenge. And the biggest success I would say is, you know, I mean, this, this was my goal and it was like my dream in a way that, um, you know, I've always been a worker. I've always wanted that sort of professional or creative side of me to, to be doing something. And, and I'm a pretty terrible stay at home mom. Like I tried it for a short time and I'm not good at it. I go a little bit stir crazy. I also don't like cleaning anything. And, you know, so for all these reasons, I'm not a great, like stay at home mom. I want to work, but I also wanted, I wanted the best of both worlds. Cause I also wanted to be available to him if he's forgotten his lunch, if he's, cause you know, I knew what it was like to grow up where your mom is literally unreachable and you, you, know, you can't do stuff after school and you're on your own for so long and all this stuff. And I didn't want that for him. And so that I feel like is my biggest achievement that I have this thing, this career that is important to me and can help support us. But on the flip side, he, he knows that he can walk in here at any time. And I'm like, Hey, what do you need? Like, let's go play a game. Like, you know, like that's, like he is my priority. Um, and I've seen some authors say it the other way, like your writing time is sacred. Uh, my writing time is not sacred. So actually my my family time is sacred. So um, I have to fit my writing time around that. So that to me is like my biggest accomplishment. And everyone's priorities are different. And it just goes to show too, you can have the best of both worlds because you are very successful and you can still prioritize your family. So I love that because I feel like a lot of people feel like they have to and it comes into the whole struggling artist act again that they have to sacrifice that family time or that personal time um and it's yeah it's just changing I guess your mindset that that you can have it all you just need to sharpen the times and make sure you stick with it not be a workaholic (laughs) yes yes it's hard I do have the tendency to be a workaholic which probably does help me on some level because I you know because Um, but there's a book by Shonda Rhimes called the year of yes. And it's where, um, I mean, it is easier because I have one child, even though I wanted more, but whatever, (laughs) um, you know, I mean, I do know that like my life could be harder in certain ways, but I, um, she talks about how, um, she was maybe feeling a little bit disconnected. So she specifically said, whenever they ask me to play, I will say yes. And, um, you know, and, and just all of the, you know, moments that come from that and, Um, it wasn't as formalized in my mind before I read her thing, but I've always felt that way. Um, that, you know, you only have a finite amount of time with your kids. And, um, and so if ever they want to spend time with me, like, or, you know, if ever he wants to spend time with me, the answer is yes. Okay. So this is my favorite question I always ask. What is the goal for you? What is the dream that you were chasing for your career? I think a lot about peace and I think a lot about comfort. And I, 
you know, and, and the word comfort is a little bit loaded because one of the other things that um, we did talk about is how growth doesn't fit in your comfort zone. Growth is not, it doesn't coexist with comfort. So I don't mean that kind of comfort. Um, but you know, the world is a little bit scary. It's actually always been a little bit scary. Um, you know, I didn't have the best childhood and, uh, and then even, you know, and then of course the past few years have just been insane for everyone. Right. So, um, so I just think a lot about, um, but really I think the pandemic has brought home what's important is that, um, even if the world is sort of like figuratively on fire and that is upsetting. And of course we should be upset and I am upset about it. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't control the world and I can only control like this literal like acre of land and what happens here and making this a safe and comfortable space for like me and my son and my husband and the, and the family and friends that we have. And even my dogs, I have four of them. So, um, you know, and so I just think about creating, you know, a peaceful space, just a space where you can relax and um, be yourself and do what you love. And actually it was just Mother's Day. And um, so I put my son on the spot, he's 13. And I put him on a spot and I said, so what do you like about, um, you know, me being your mother? And he said um, that I can follow my passions. So, in, which I totally didn't expect him to say. And I was like, oh, uh, but I think that that kind of is part of it, you know, just, um, not feeling like you have to be anyone else. And so, yeah, I think peace is, is big for me. I would love to know um, what your advice is for those who possibly, we talk about imposter syndrome often. Um, and it is something that I see really regularly that people feel like they do have to go through the struggling artist act. And more than anything, it has to do with lack of confidence in their actual product. So what advice would you have for those authors? Because I uh, personally, I believe that it does block people from going to the next level into their career until they step over that mountain. What is your advice to authors that may be struggling with this? So I recently heard um, Seth Godin say something about imposter syndrome that I thought was really interesting and I've been pondering it, which is that anytime you are doing something new. It's not that you might go through imposter syndrome. It's that imposter syndrome is a natural result of doing something creative and new because you are literally doing something that's never been done before. And so, you know, even the number of books that I've written, it's like 30 plus at this point. But when I write a book, it feels, I'll actually say it feels like an act of faith um, because it, it actually feels to me like I won't finish it. Like as I'm writing the first sentence, I'm like, this is crazy. I have this is the first sentence of a whole book. Like, it's not going to happen. My husband already expects this every time I go to him at different stages of the book. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. He's like, you say this every time. And I'm like, this time is different. Um, but on the flip side, were I to feel like, yeah, of course. I mean, this is just rote. That would be, that would mean that I was not um, doing anything creative or challenging to me. And so, you know, so it's, it's less like, imposter syndrome as the enemy, I think, and more like this is a natural result of me pushing my boundaries and trying something new. And it happens both, I think, creatively, but also kind of like on the business side, right? Because if you do, um, you know, Facebook ads, like even, you know, uh, like now this year, you know, I have authors who not only get stressed if they can't make a profitable ad, but ironically, and every time this happens, get stressed when they can make a profitable ad because it just feels so new and so uncertain. And also there's this whole like fear of success thing going on. Um, but, and so, so with imposter syndrome, there's also a, a quote that feels related to me, something about how, um, if I know, if I'm not failing, then I know I'm not trying enough different things. So like actually using failure as the bar for I'm trying enough, using imposter syndrome, instead of trying to like avoid it, like, ew, icky or whatever, it feels bad. And so look at it like, oh, this means I'm challenging myself. That is such a good end note to take. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. I will employ that. That's perfect. Um, I do have a new segment. It's a quick uh, five rapid question one. So it's called speed dating with an author. So you know, I'm going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. Um, and my first question is, what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? 
Um, well, uh, probably many, many in my life, but I will just share this particular one that happened this weekend. We went from Mother's Day to the Melting Pot, which is a fondue restaurant. And so you have these tongs and you put things in the like cheese or the, the chocolate or whatever. And for some reason, and I've been there, I think it's because we've been there plenty of times, but then the pandemic happened and we didn't go to any restaurant for a really long time. So I guess I forgot how to like eat. So I had this songs and for some reason, I just thought it would be a good, like without thinking at all, just like rested it on my lip for like a thoughtful pose and burn my lip. And so right now you actually can't see it, but it hurt a lot. And now it keeps like feeling and stuff, which is lovely. And it's just like now, you know, apparently I can't be trusted to like eat at restaurants. <laughs> You're going to have to retrain yourself like going back out into the wild again, how to eat cheese fondue. It's crazy. I hope it's still soon. Um, what are the three words you would best describe yourself with? I mean, sleepy for sure. I'm like the embodiment of the princess and the pea. Um, so, which is by the way, not the best story. Like, I don't know if you ever heard it, but like, just it's just a weird story but yeah that's me unfortunately I don't choose it I don't make the rules that's just how it is um okay so sleepy I feel like dependable I'm like a tourist and they're just like really steady like you know count on people and then wait does that mean you have recently had a birthday yes yes I get a birthday and then I get Mother's Day so poor husband <laughs> has to figure out two things to get me I know <laughs> do you know Becca Symes she does the like dear writer you need to quit books and she has this thing about your strengths and so um I would say and so there's my strength my number one strength under her like system is called intellection and basically that means I like to think to ridiculous degrees this is both a good and a bad thing but I would say that that kind of describes me so the word intellection would be weird and without this but I would just say a little bit of a philosopher well, those are good answers. <laughs> what song would best describe you? Oh my gosh. This one gets everyone. I absolutely love asking it. I have not changed it because it just gets everyone. <laughs> See, that's, a, that's the hard part because you just have favorite songs, but that doesn't mean they necessarily describe you, right? I'll just, I'll just go with Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen. Did I get his name right or wrong? Um, it can be on say so it's... <laughs> an incredible song so you know could listen to it all day every day and probably do perfect let's lock it in then <laughs> you seem so uncertain but we'll lock it in <laughs> i know <laughs> i could change my mind at any moment <laughs> um what's your life motto so i think it would definitely be about um growth and comfort um so i think the quote by someone at ibm possibly the ceo at some point was that growth and comfort do not coexist. So I kind of stick to that. If I feel too safe, if I don't feel like I'm taking risks, then I know that I'm not growing. What is a very unique talent or skill set that people do not know you have? Uh, people do not know that I got my black belt in martial arts. Oh my God. So That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and also like I used to teach it. I was like... I was like very, very into it. And, you know, and it's funny because I really did it for, I just loved it. Like I just had a passion for it, but it had nothing to do with fighting, you know, and it really, and you don't spend a lot of, even though you do like sparring and stuff. I mean, a lot of it's about just like form and technique and even like your energy and all of this other stuff It has nothing to do with fighting. And even like, you know, my, you know, my instructor would always say like, you know, the best way like to win a fight is to avoid it, et cetera. Like it was just, it was just the antithesis of fighting. Um, but there was this one time and I was walking away from a guy and he grabbed my wrist and I didn't want him to grab my wrist and like no thought went into it. And I just turned back and I did a thing and he was like, ow, like, what, why did you do that? And I was like, I'm sorry, but not that sorry. <laughs> <laughs> feel a little torn. I mean, I didn't do it on purpose, but do you deserve it? Maybe. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it just, it, uh, puts it in you. So like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And note, you're badass. We will not <laughs> mess with this. 
I've had such a good time. What is what is coming out for you? Where do we where do we stalk you? Where do we connect? So Private Property was my last release and it's going to be like my focus for the year because it's the first book in a new trilogy. So it'll be Private Property and then Straight Confidence and then Best Kept Secret. And it is a Jane Eyre retelling. So if you like Jane Eyre or um, a lot of people have read it who weren't into it, but, and so actually my PR person was like, don't tell readers that because then they feel like they have to. But if I'm speaking more to like authors, I mean, we, a lot of, most of us have read Jane Eyre. And, and so like, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, so it's a Jane Eyre retelling. I've been wanting to write it forever and I finally did. So um, yeah, and that's what I'm doing. And so you can find me at um, skywarren.com. It's S-K-Y-E warren.com. And I am also pretty active on Instagram, Sky Warren Books. And I'm trying to make TikTok a thing. I think I'm also Sky Warren Books there. So amazing. Well, I will, I'm pretty sure I'm following you already on Instagram and Facebook, but I will add you on TikTok as <laughs> well. So watch your space. Um, but I have had such a good time. Thank you so much for coming on and just being you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kia. I really appreciate being here and your thoughtful questions. And it was it was so fun to chat with you. And yeah, I mean, I love especially being able to connect during these crazy times when we're still not able to meet in person and everything to have this venue. So I appreciate it. It's like, hey, social life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> sort of. Um, well, I'm going to love you and leave you. Hopefully one day we can get you back on. And until then, uh, I wish you much, much more success, should I say. Thank you. Bye. Bye.